Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I thank God for this privilege and honour to be here this afternoon to share about the topic of giving, the topic of offering. It seems to be the tradition of the church every year on November to talk about the topic of givings. It also helped us to prepare to count God's blessings for the entire year this year and also to prepare us for the pledges and tidings next year. We will be going through the Bible today. We talk about Abraham. Abraham was the first person who actually gave 10% of his earnings. And then we will subsequently look at how eventually he actually sacrificed Isaac as an offering to God. This morning, we will not go through all the life details, but we will go through some of the very important life events that change Abraham's spiritual walks with God and accordingly change his attitudes towards giving. The journey of faith by Abraham actually comes from Genesis chapter 12, when God actually asked Abraham to leave his country, his people, and his father's household to do a, a go, go to a place when God commanded him. There, he wants to bless him, and he wants to make him a great nation, and fathers to be blessings of many people. Abraham left, according to the biblical records, Abraham left together with the father all the way to Harem, stay in Harem, and subsequently moved to the land of Canaan after his father's died. At the age of 75, we see that Abraham left from Harem, took his wife Sarai, and also Lot, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions that they have accumulated and all the people they have acquired in Haram and actually moved down to, to the land of Canaan. When they reached the land of Canaan, there was a famine. Abraham was probably very confident because he got abundant wealth. He got a lot of people, a lot of wealth, so he was very confident. But the famine was very severe and he needs to move down to Egypt. So we, this is the first time we saw fear occur in Abraham's life. This fear may not be to himself personally, but to his household, because his household was big, and he needs to move down to Egypt. Along the way, when he moved down to Egypt, he reckoned that the Egyptians would kill him because his wife was very beautiful. So he told his wife Sarai to tell a lie, that they were brother and sisters. So this is, then they move on to the Egypt. Upon reaching the Egypt, thinking that Sarai was the sister of Abraham, the Pharaoh actually wanted to marry him, but God intervened. Because of God's intervention, we see that God sent him, the Pharaoh, after knowing God's intervention, sent him away together with what he has gotten. In the process, Abraham became very rich, very wealthy, and with flocks in silver and gold. And even his nephew, Lot, has a lot of flocks, herds, herds and also tents. We look at Abraham when he moved out from Haram to actually to, to the land of Canaan. He was very confident. However, because of the famine, we will plunge a person from leaving a comfort zone into a fear zone, and because of that fear zone, he was panicked, and he was actually leading, trying to find God's guidance. And we see that through, throughout the thing, he was blessed by God because of God's intervention. Then we can see from this point is that we can see that Abraham actually believed in God. And to believe, to believe is an act of faith, and to trust is an experience of faith. We look at Abraham believe is an act of faith, and to trust is an experience of faith. Many years ago, 
probably 40 years ago, four decades ago, uh, when I did, was dating my girlfriend then, today is my wife, sitting here. She asked me, once asked me a question. She asked me this question, how much do you love me? This is a very difficult question then. My answer then was, if I would tell you that I love you, it would be a lie. But when we, were, when we are 60 years old, when I tell you that I love you, that love is truly, truly be the true love. When I said that, then I was 22 years old. Today, I'm 60 years old. That time, she believed me. Today, she trusts me. So, to believe is an act of faith. To trust is an experience of faith. We look at Abraham. He moved from a comfort zone and go into the fear zone. Today, how are we going to move from a comfort zone to go into the fear zone and depending lesser on our possessions and depending more on God? The next episode, we can see that they moved to a land when in Genesis chapter 13, they moved to a land of battle and the land could not support them because they got too many possessions. So Abraham uh, and Lot's shepherd actually started a quarrel. Abraham said to Lot, we should not quarrel, we should not quarrel and our shepherds should not quarrel with one another because we are close relatives. Is not the land before you, the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Lord, look around and look forward, and the whole plain of Jordan towards Joah was well watered. He chose, he chose that it's like the garden of the Lord and also the land of Egypt. Lord chose the land towards Joah, the whole plains towards the Jordan, and think that that should be the, the place that they, 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 he wants to be. They parted company. Lot went to Jordan, the whole plain, and pitched his tents near Sodom. Sodom, during that time, has a city of wicked people, and they were sinning greatly against the Lord. From this episode, we see that Abraham was able to Trust God and let Lord make the first choice when they were parting companies over this side. God is the architect of our life. Many a times, He wants us to move from our comfort zone, out from our comfort zone. He put us into trials and He wants us to have different life experiences when, because He wants to build our faith. In 1 Corinthians, God is faithful he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. When we are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can enjoy it. We can see that when God put us into, into a, a situation of a, a place that we are tempted, He will protect us. He will lead us out of temptation and let us into safety. Next, we come to the, the battle of the four kings and the five kings. Over here, we see that the battle of Sidon, there were five cities in the plain of Canaan, including the city of uh, uh, Sodom. This city of Sodom and the five cities, all the cities all band together, they actually surrendered to a king, a very powerful king, the king of Cataloma. Cataloma was very powerful during that time, and scholars subsequently found that Cataloma was the predecessor of Babylon. So the five kings succumbed to Cataloma for 12 years. On the 13th year, they actually stood up together and rebelled against Cataloma. Straight away, Cataloma summoned three of his alliance and actually four, the four kings actually came down to fight with the, with the five kings. Over this side, we saw that actually the battle is ha happened actually in the valley of Sidim. 
And actually overnight, we saw that when the, when the four kings actually came down, he actually got locked into captivity together with all the belongings. When Abraham heard this, heard this, that Lot was actually captured, he actually gathered 318 of his strongest men. Overnight, he chased Cataloma and defeated Cataloma, got all the people back, all the belongings back, and rescued Lot. Question is that, how could it be possible for a 318 men to actually to fight against an army of thousands of the four kings? Is it possible to do that? Yes, it is not possible to do that unless it is with the help of God. We can see that there are many stories in the Bible that actually there are few men that can perform the miracles of the 318 men. One of the cues that we can, take, we can take from the Bible is the story of Gideon. Gideon was living in the in the, in the, in the uh, life that during that time in the is Israel history that they were attacked by neighboring countries and neighboring forces. They are always bullied by them. Then Gideon was called to be the commander of this country, of this uh, Israelite country, to fight against the Midianites. He was started, he started with 32,000 strong of people, of men. And he felt very good because with 32,000 of strong men and fighters, that is a good force to fight against the Midianites. But God said to him, he said, you have too many people. Can you announce to your, to your troops? So he announced to the troops, those people who are chicken-hearted, you can go back to the chicken coop. Before he finished his sentence, 22,000, two-thirds of the men walk out and go back to their, to their family. He was left with 10,000. It is still a big fighting force. It is still a good force to fight against the Midianites. But God continued to say, you still got too many men. Then Gideon was instructed to march the men throughout the wilderness to go to an oasis with a body of water. He was to observe how the people drink the water. The soldiers, when he met the oasis with the body of water, because they are so tired and almost dying of thirst, they fell down to the floor, lapped the water like a dog. Only a few men actually stood on their feet. They hold the water with their cup hands and drink it. Gideon was instructed to take these men. How many of them? 300. With the 300 men, Gideon defeated the Midianites. If Gideon was given the 10,000 or the 22,000, he would have already lost the battle. So God is performing miracles in Gideon's life, as well as miracles in, in uh, Abram's life. In the battle of Sidim, we can see that there are only 318 men that Abraham actually gathered and actually rescued Lot. And we can see that we can see that Abraham know that this is the work of, the, of, the, of, of, of God. It's not by his own effort and his own wisdom. When he came back, two kings, one of them is the king of Sodom, the other one is the king of, king of Salem, Melchizedek, came out and received him. So they, when they came out to receive him, and Melchizedek took up bread and wine to receive him. In the Bible, it says that Melchizedek is the priest of the high God. Then he said, he blessed Abraham to say that Abraham, blessed be Abraham by God the Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils. At the same time, the king Sodom actually said to Abraham, give me the people and take the goods for yourself. And Abraham replied to king Sodom, with raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord Most High, creator of God and heaven, of heaven and earth. I will not take anything from you, not even a thread or a, a strap of the sandal, so that you will not be able to say that I, you make 
Abraham's reach. First, we can examine that King Melchizedek, or Priest Melchizedek, actually what he did is that he turned Abraham's attention to God rather than to turn attention to man. Let's examine the sequence of events. You look here, before King Sodom actually uttered a word to say that, okay, why don't you take my goods uh, and give me the people, King Mel Melchizedek actually uh, speak first. He said that, okay, go to the, look at the heaven and earth, and heaven and earth is very important in this case. And he didn't say, don't fall into the trap, don't fall into the trap of greed. So he said, heaven and earth over this side shows that God created everything. So in this case, in contrast, Sodom's gifts was actually pale in contrast. And God is very powerful because he said, God's most high. So God gave Abraham this victory, and it is not Abraham himself. And this is very important. And it changed the perspective of offering fundamentally to Abraham and to all of us. This declaration, of these two declarations, God's most high and also creator of heaven and earth, actually gave Abraham something else that Martha Luther, Martha Luther actually said something. In fact, God doesn't need to have anything from us. And Martin Luther said, we cannot give God anything for everything is already His and all we have come from Him. We can only give Him praise, thanks and honour. There are many kinds of giving. One of them is grudge giving. But we want to give God joyfully and willingly. If we talk about grudge giving, it means that we, we have to. I, ought, I have to give God. But if we are talking about duty giving, I ought to give God. But what we want to give God our, 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 ours is, I want to, I have to. I, I want to give God. God doesn't need our offering. One of the stories that I had, I remember, is that when my daughter started work many years ago, he, she, she started to give us, together with Elder Daphne and myself, some uh, monthly allowance. Although we don't need the monthly allowance, but we know that she gave us from the heart, and we actually appreciate that. God will appreciate if we give joyfully. There was another spiritual lesson that we can learn from here. When we bless others, turn their attention to God. God, the devil, will look at us whether we win or we lose. But if we lose, it's obvious. But when we win, sometimes our pride may overcome us. It's very important to turn our attention, to bring our attention, our brothers and sisters' attention to God. Let me share a personal story over this side. Many years ago, about 10, 10, 13 years ago, I was sent to, to Indonesia to do some work over that side. And you, those who know that in my industry, it is a very competitive industry. So sometimes when we are ranked in terms of our performance, in terms of our group, so it's very competitive. When I came back, my group ranking actually dropped among the top to number 28. So that year, that year, over that what, just one year, Miraculously, actually, the group ranking actually rose from number 28 to number one, miraculously, because it, is, it will never happen. And more importantly and more amazingly is that that year was our company 100 years anniversary, and we were ranked number one. It could not happen. It could not happen. And I know that this is a miracle by the Lord. So, and most importantly, and more, more, more so is that I only got 26 people and the number one, the previous number one ranking was 95. So I know that this is God's miracle. But amazingly, when I was receiving the awards the following year, before I went to the stage, I went to the toilet. When I came back from the toilet, a brother that I didn't know very well suddenly uttered a verse to me. He said, when God is for us, who can be against us? I didn't know him very well. But when he uttered that word, I was shocked. But he moved me. He actually shifted my attention to God. When I said that, okay, this is God's glory, God's honour. So I look at the whole thing is that, yes, 
Can we do more with less? Yes, we can do more with less, with God's help, with God's miracle. When we look at the same incident over this side, when Abraham came back, came back, and we see that the Satan's tactics is to ask Abraham to give Abraham the goods and ask Abraham to give, uh, give Sodom uh, the, the, the people. It's a very uncanny similarities of, uh, in Luke chapter 12, is the rich, foolish, uh, rich man uh, over, over that side. Over this side, we look at how Abraham replied to uh, Sodom, King Sodom, is that with raised hand, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord. I will never, I will never, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I make Abraham's reach. Over this side, we see that when we are confronted with this greed or possessions or goods, we have to identify who our true master is. God wants us to be a, a good stewards of possessions, but more importantly, God also wants us to be a good steward of life. Abraham have gone through many precious lessons in their life. The greatest lesson that Abraham has gone through is when he was 99 years old. God appeared to him to promise him to have a child. Abraham told himself, I'm so old, and Sarah was also so old. In fact, on that day, God changed his name from Abraham to Abraham. And Sarai's name was changed from Sarai to Sarah because God said Abraham is a father of many nations. So Abraham fell face down to God, towards God, and he thinks that it's impossible for him to have a child because he will be 100 years old one year later and Sarah will be 90 years old. Can a, can a, can a person at 90 years old still give birth to, to a child? So Abraham replied to God, if only Ismail might live under your blessings. But God says, yes, but Sarah is going to bear you a child and you will call his name Isaac. Abraham and Sarah were very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. When Sarah heard this, she laughed to herself and she thought, For I am worn out, and, only, and, and my Lord is old. Will I now have this uh, pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, to Sarah, to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now, and I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Abraham had earlier received the promise of God to make him father of many nations, but yet he didn't really, he, he didn't really know that what God would actually appeal and appear and make this happen. So he tried from Haram all the way to Canaan. He tried many methods. And every time when he tried his own method, he was met with miseries. It is the same as the Bible, that there is also a person who are also trying his best. But every time when he tried his best, he met with uh, miseries. And this person dropped from full of confidence to no confidence. And this person is Moses. When Moses was young, we can saw that we, we saw that he was full of confidence. He wanted to deliver his people, but when he was old, when he was older, he lost all his confidence. When he was younger, Moses Junior said that everything depended on him, but Moses Senior said nothing depended on him. One was presumptuous; the other one was cynical. Moses Junior said, "I can do things. I can do it." Moses Senior said, who am I? I can't do it. And how did God actually train Moses? He drove Moses out to the desert for 40 years. Over that side, he had to tend to the ship over that side because 40 years, Moses Junior becomes Moses Senior. When Moses Senior lost all the confidence and when he felt the most inadequate and worthless, God called again, appeared to him, and called him to finish what he had started. 
Life is about the stewardship. Stewardship is life. Life is about stewardship. Stewardship is not managing possessions, but stewardship is managing life. We look at how God actually taught Moses this lesson, and these lessons we will also want to learn it today. You look at Moses, when God asked him to throw the staff on, onto the ground, onto the floor, the staff actually belongs to Moses, but it actually belongs to God as well. When the staff reaches the, reached the floor, it became a snake. When God asked Moses to reach out to take the, take the snake, to reach out to take the snake, it became the staff. So the staff is actually belongs to Moses, but the staff also belongs to God. God asked Moses to put his hand into his cloak, and when he took out the hand, it was leprous. When the God asked him to put his hand back into the cloak, and we, 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 we saw that when he took out his hand, the hand was restored, the skin was restored, like the rest of the body. What we hold in our hands belongs to us. Actually, it also belongs to God. What we want to know is that it's part of our body, but it's also what part of what God wants to give us. God raised Moses in the palace, but God also drove Moses away to the desert. He needs to be there for 40 years, shepherding ships, because his life mission is to bring 2 million people from Canaan all the way to the, to, uh, from Egypt all the way to the uh, promised land. And God is a God of purpose, because God doesn't do anything, anything in vain. He planned everything, and he wants Moses to be there, to be there to learn how to do, how to shepherd ships. God is also a God of timing, perfect timing. Why did Moses fail in the first place when he started in Egypt? Because his time was not uh, up yet. He was prepared, but not fully prepared. He had been to school, but had not yet graduated. So we look at the life is a stewardship because God wants to mold him and wants him to learn that his life does not belong to himself. His life also belongs to God. And God has all the perfect timing. Whose life are we living today? Are we living a life of ourselves? Are we living a life for God? You look at over this side, we are not called to do something that will change the world. We will not do something to deliver the people or build the nations. We will not ask to move from one land to another land like Abraham. But every one of, our, of one actually can live a life of significance. We can do is making the community better, place to live in. We may bring our children to live with faith and courage in a harsh world. It may also be something that the lives of people with love and we can change and bring good news to people into their lives. So we can do a lot, a lot of things. The life is not ours, but God actually wants us to have a life for Him. So He breathed His life into us. It is everything God gives us with the life that He breathes into us. It is also all the things belong to God, but they have been given to us. So they also belong to us we can use them, neglect them, or ignore them. But the responsibility is ours. So when we are tempted to claim credit on our life, remember this life is, belongs to God. When we started to disclaim credit on our life, remember this life is given to us, we need to make use of it. We, want, we don't want to abuse it. Isaac was given to... Abraham when he was 100 years old. And this is the greatest lesson that Abraham learned and also we want to learn as well. At 100 years old, God actually called Abraham to bring Isaac, his only son, his beloved son, to a place that he, God wants him to sacrifice Isaac. So he wants, Isaac, he wants Abraham to bring Isaac to a mountain of God's uh, God, God will tell him where to go. In, in fact, it's in the region of Moriah. So God wants him to sacrifice Isaac there. And Isaac did exactly as what, had, what God has commanded. 
Over this side, we see that God actually spared Isaac's life by preparing a ram for Isaac, for Abraham to take and, and, and sacrifice as a burnt offering. But we must know that this ram is not given until God knows that Abraham actually wanted to sacrifice Isaac. Our life is us, is for us. We can see that for Abraham's life, he once was very confident when he left Harem. When he left Harem all the way to the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Canaan, he was very confident. But along the way, he met with famine. Fear came in. So when fear came in, he was totally uh, almost gone in terms of his life because he needed to move to move to Egypt. But from fear, all the way, one step at a, at a time, move all the way to the complete trust of God. And this is a journey of faith. We can see that the journey of faith for Abraham is from fear all the way to complete trust. Today, God wants to use us. God wants us to move from our comfort zone. God wants us to move out of comfort zone and into the fear zone. During the fear zone, God wants us to believe in Him, trust in Him, wants us to do a lot of things, and He wants to move us from fear because in the, in the fear zone, sometimes we move out of the comfort zone, in the fear zone, we don't know what to do. But God will, will, will lead us one step at a time from fear zone all the way to 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 trust, complete trust of Him. Today, we ask a question of ourselves. If God one day asks us to sacrifice the most important thing in our life, what will be our response? Who is the Isaac in our life? What is the Isaac is our, in our life? When God asks us to sacrifice our Isaac in our life, what will be our response? Offering must come from our hearts. There was a Christian, Christian brother. Every week, he prepared ten dollars and put his in his pocket. So week after week, he continued to offer this ten dollars to the church. One day, when he was going to the church hurriedly, somebody returned him a hundred dollars owed to him. He put this hundred dollars in the same pocket that he 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 came. During the offering, he took out this $100 and put into the offering bag. And he saw it, the $100 was in the offering bag, but it's too late and too embarrassed to take the $100 back. At night, he dreamt about the angel was counting the money. So when angel came to his offering, his, he said, someone offered $10. He protested, he said, no, I offered $100. Then the angel said, someone offered $10, but $100, but because he's only willing to give $10, so counted as only $10. So the question is, our offering must come from our hearts. Singapore Life Church has gone through many, many generations. Some of us here are the second generation, third generation, fourth generations. And a lot of us are passing our faith from one generation to another generation. And our, our wealth, our experience, our network and all that passing on to the second generation. I saw some of the young people has already been uh, leaders. It becomes a leader in the church, in the session court. And we look at this transition, a, a, a transition and a, a generation Faith transfer is actually from one generation to another generation. But from this offering, the journey of faith, what we want to know is that, what we want to learn is that Abraham actually from fear all the way to a complete trust. Are we able to move from one generation to another generation so that our life church will benefit from our faith of this generation, generational faith transfer from one generation to another generation? So I just pray and hope that God will continue to bless Life Church abundantly, not only in generations, but many generations to come. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have given us. 
You have provided us with more than we could ever have imagined. You have surrounded us with people who always look out for us. You have given us families and friends who bless us every day with kind words and actions. They lift us up in ways that keep, us, keep our eyes focused on you and make our spirits soar. And we thank God for keeping us safe, especially during this global pandemic. You help us to make better choices and provide us with advices to help us with life difficult decisions. We are so thankful for all your blessings in our life, Lord. We pray that you remind us of how, just how blessed we are, that we may bring our offerings to you with a grateful heart. And may our desire to be fruitful stewards of life and bring glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.